Hello friends, Kerrigan Skelly here from Pinpoint Evangelism. It's uh, February 14th, 2012, about 7 o'clock in the morning, and it's, uh, it's Valentine's Day. And um, I had this dream last night that I feel compelled to share with you. You know, most of us have dreams every day according to statistics, and... Um, but most of these dreams we would have to, you know, write down as soon as we woke up in order to remember them. But oftentimes, you know, the Bible says that in the last days the Lord will, uh, the old men will dream dreams. So I guess I'm, I guess I'm getting old. Um, and a dream, when the Lord gives you a dream, I believe that you, it's, it's very hard to forget. It's not one of those ones you have to uh, wake up and write down as soon as you can. Uh, you just don't forget it. And uh, I believe this dream is from the Lord. Um, so last night I was sleeping, of course, and I had this dream about this young man and young woman. And um, the young man grew up in a Christian household. Um, he knew the Lord at a young age, the life of holiness and purity, uh, reading his Bible, um, raised in a godly family where he was taught to pray and to value scripture and to evangelize. Never really gave himself over to sin. At least not like I did when I was a young man. And uh, he met this young lady at college, a Christian college. And this young lady had a different background. She, she was not raised in a Christian household. Uh, she had been a fornicator and drunkard throughout high school. Uh, but at the end of her high school days, she gave her life to the Lord and repented of all those things, was living a life of holiness and purity. And when these two met, it seemed to be a perfect match. Uh, they both loved God and wanted to seek Him with all their hearts. They both wanted to be used by God. And uh, the Lord led them, through much prayer, to decide to get engaged. And uh, after getting engaged, the young man proposed and she accepted. You know, he went to the Father like he was supposed to and and uh, it was accepted by the father and mother and, and by the, the young woman herself and very much uh, lots of joy involved in the situation because they, they both knew it was God's will and the young man went away back to his to his family's house prepare for the wedding prepare for the marriage um, and uh, you know he had a certain day he'd come back by to finish making the final preparations with his future wife for the marriage and and uh, he decided to come back early and surprise her. And uh, just because he loved her and he wanted to see her and he wanted to give her a surprise visit. Uh, and as he, um, he waited for her in her dorm room, he didn't, uh, made sure that all, none of her friends would tell her that he was there. Uh, he waited longer than he thought he would and, and she came back at night and as she busted into her dorm room, she was being kissed on and groped by another man. And her back was turned as she came through the door. And her fiancé was aghast. His heart was broken. And I could just, I'll tell you friends, this dream was so real to me. Not because I've ever been through anything like that, because I haven't. But I just felt this man's broken heart. That this woman he loved, who he was engaged to be married to, and she was engaged to him, and they, and they kept themselves pure uh, throughout their engagement. And both were living holy lives. His heart was broken, and as she turned to see him there, she was surprised, of course, that he was there, that he returned what he did instead of when he originally said he would, that, she, that he wanted to surprise her because he loved her so much and wanted to see her and, and be with her until they got married. And he, he didn't know what to say. He was so brokenhearted, so distraught over what he was seeing that she would betray him like that. And as she tried to explain, she simply said, I just wanted to be with another man one more time. Just one more time. Can't you understand that? And of course he could understand it. And he walked away. He broke off the engagement. He broke off the marriage. <laughs> and as I woke up, I now woke up from my dream. I thought to myself, Lord, why, why did you give me this dream? It doesn't make any sense to me that... Uh, why would you make me even think about this? I mean, I'm married. I have five children and happily married. I love my wife. She loves me. 
and uh, then he, as I thought about it, and, and I couldn't, couldn't go, it's about 5 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't go back to sleep. I thought about it and prayed about it, and the Lord made it as clear as a bell. Um, here's your David Nathan moment, friends, those of you who profess Christ. The parable of the story is that that woman are his profession Christians. That woman is most professing Christians. Because so many professing Christians want to say to God, I just want my sin one more time. Just one last time, Lord. Can't you understand that? Just one more time. And no, he cannot understand that, friends, for he's coming back for a bride who is spotless, without wrinkle, the Bible says. But you say, God's commandments are too hard to obey. But the Bible says in 1 John 5, 3 that this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. But you may say, the, the temptation is so strong, I can't handle it. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has seized you, has overtaken you, except such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You say, but I, I'm in the flesh. I, 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 I can't obey God. It's, it's, it's too hard. But the Bible says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And if you walk according to the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. <laughs> but you say, well, I, I'll be holy when I get to heaven. I have the grace of God now. Well, Romans 6.14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. And Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God, which brings salvation, has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So what's the problem, friends? You know, and I tell you that the as I sensed, as I felt my broken heart waking up as a third person in the story, who had never been through that, and, and I'm sure will never go through what this young, young man went through. It was amazing to me. You see, one part is the church, is the professing church, those who claim to be Christ, those who claim to be betrothed or engaged to Him, those who claim to belong to Him, who say to Him, "I want to go back to my sin one more time." I see the broken heart of God. That God is broken. That He, for the one that He shed His blood for, the one He shed His blood for, is not willing to keep themselves spotless, without wrinkle, without any stain, without any blame, and live holy and pure for Him. You know, in 1 Peter, uh, I'm just going to paraphrase here, it says, uh, you know, be holy as He is holy. And, you know, throughout all your stay here, conduct yourselves in fear. And it gives two reasons why you should be holy as He is holy. And, and throughout all your walk here, conduct yourself, your time here, your stay here in this place as sojourners, as pilgrims, as aliens in this place. Conduct yourselves in fear. There's two reasons it gives in First Peter chapter 1. Number one, God is going to judge impartially. Impartially, friends. He's going to judge you. Uh, even those who claim to be His, He will judge you impartially. And the Bible makes it clear in 2 Timothy 2.19 that the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, God knows who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But getting back to 1 Peter, the first reason is because God is going to judge you impartially. He knows whether you're a hypocrite or not, friends. He knows whether you're truly living for him or not. You're not going to fool him. Solomon says that even the secret things, things done in darkness, will be brought into judgment. Friends, you can't hide your secret sin from God. You have to give it up. You have to obey him and live for him. So the first reason that God gives in 1 Peter 1, Peter writing in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is that you should conduct your time here, throughout your time here in fear, because God is going to judge impartially. 
And secondly, because Christ shed his blood for you. His precious blood for you. And how dare we, how dare any Christian, trample that precious blood underfoot that was shed for them for the forgiveness, for the remission of sins, that was shed for them for the cleansing of their past filthiness, like that woman in the story. That young woman who lived an ungodly life, who was redeemed from that and was living holy and pure. She was genuine, a genuine Christian. And yet that young man, even though she had this past of sin, even though she had this past of wickedness, he was willing to be married to her. He was willing to be betrothed to her, engaged to her, because he saw her present state. He saw that she was changed. He saw that she was a new creature in Christ Jesus. And friends, if, if you truly are a Christian, you are changed, you are different, you're not living for the world anymore, and if you're that woman in the story, uh, know this, friends, know this, that you are not married to Christ yet, Christian. You are simply betrothed to Christ. You are not married to him yet. See, the marriage does not happen until the wedding feast. And the wedding feast does not happen, according to the Bible, until Christ returns and his church, the saints, are gathered together to him. That's when the wedding feast begins. And, of course, in the Bible, the, the, the bride and the groom um, are married, and the marriage is consummated during, after the wedding feast. And then they begin to cohabitate together. And see, we don't begin to cohabitate with Christ until the millennial reign. And of course, Christ returns before that happens, and the wedding feast is the beginning of the millennial reign. And so you have not begun to cohabitate with Christ yet, Christian. You have not entered, in, entered into the wedding feast yet. And if you try to enter into the wedding feast, you knock on that door and try to enter into the wedding feast with filthy, dirty garments... Christ will turn you away. He will not be allowed to enter in. Because he's coming back for a bride that is without spot and without blemish. So you need to know, friends, you're not married to Christ yet. You're simply betrothed to him. Don't be one of those foolish virgins who doesn't have enough oil in her lamp and does not persevere today and says to Christ, Oh, Christ, I just wanted to sin one more time. I just wanted my sin one more time, Christ. He says to you, I do not know you. And notice in that parable of the wise and foolish virgins, which Jesus talked about in Matthew, it didn't say, I never knew you. It said, I do not know you. See, there are true Christians, those who are genuine right now, or who have been genuine at some point in time, who are going to fall away. You know, the Bible says in Matthew 24, that in the last days, lawlessness will abound. And because of this, the love of most. Now, most translations say many, but the Greek word says it means a greater, greater part. The love of most will grow cold. Has your love grown cold, friends? Has your love grown cold for the groom? You know, I, I think back to my, to my wedding day and how as me, the groom, watched the bride come down the aisle, how great joy was in my heart because she had kept herself pure for me and I kept myself pure for her. And now the cohabitation began. Now our relationship began. Now we became one flesh. And friends, Christ is not looking forward to a bride walking down the aisle with a white dress on that is full of mud and dirt and grime. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine a bride in the natural sense walking down an aisle to her groom? And she's walking down there with a white wedding dress on that's filthy with mud and stains and dirt and blood or whatever else it may be. He wouldn't be happy or excited about that. He wouldn't be looking forward to that. He wouldn't expect that. And the father who's giving away the bride would not be taking would not take pleasure. Now he wouldn't be proud to give away a daughter who looks like that. And friends, if you think the father is going to present to his son, talking about the spiritual sense now, can present to his son a bride that is filthy and dirty with sin, he better think again. He's not going to, friends. He's not going to. 
And the ironic thing, friends, uh, obviously it's not really ironic, I think God planned this, that last night before I fell asleep I was reading Ephesians, where it talks about this. Where it talks about how, you know, the, the, the husband ought to love Christ, ought to love his, his, his bride, his wife, like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might cleanse her and wash her and present her as a bride who is without spot, without blemish. And that's what Christ wants. But I want, I, you know, for those of you out there who do have filthy garments right now, who do want, who are saying to Christ, whether they're saying it with their words, they are saying it with their lifestyle, I just want my sin one more time. There is hope for you. Christ is willing to have mercy upon you. He's willing to cleanse you one more time. But it needs to stop, friends. It needs to come to an end. You need to follow Jesus Christ and do it wholeheartedly. If you're one of those ones, the Bible has a word for you in James 4. <laughs> Adulterers and adulteresses. For if you are cheating on Christ, you are an adulterer or adulteress. You're like Joseph thought of Mary before he found out the truth. That he wanted to put her away. And Christ, friends, if you're one of these adulterers and adulterers, if you don't repent, if Christ comes back surprisingly like a thief in the night if you're one of those adulterers and adulteresses friends he will put you away but it won't be privately it won't be uh, with dignity you'll be put away into hellfire that's what will happen to you friends it's not what I want for you not what God wants for you not what God wants for anybody but he will do it he will do it but if you're one of those adulterers or adulteresses as James 4 talks about you need to draw near to God and he will draw near to you you need to cleanse your hands you sinners purify your hearts you double-minded lament and mourn and weep let your laughter turn to mourning and your joy to gloom humble yourself in the sight of God and he will lift you up so there's hope if you'll humble yourself there's hope if you'll seek him there's hope if you'll cleanse your hands and purify your hearts what that means is repent there's hope for you. You know, if your eye causes you sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you sin, cut it off. For it's better, better to enter into life maimed with one eye, one hand, one foot than go to hell with both your eyes, both your hands, or both your feet. Your sin is not worth it, friends. God is going to judge you impartially. Christ shed his precious blood for you. And according to the Bible, you'd be better off not knowing, not ever have knowing the way of righteousness than to know the way of righteousness and to turn from the holy command and go back to wallowing in the mud and eating and licking up your vomit, which is what sin is. So friends, I implore you, get right with God. Don't be the one who breaks Christ's heart as you continue in sin. Don't be the one who is put away like Mary almost was by Joseph. Like the foolish virgins were when they were turned away and say, I don't know you. Christ is going to return, friends. And he only returns, in the Bible, he only returns a thief of night, and a thief, as a thief in the night to those who are not watching, who are not waiting, who are not praying, who are not keeping themselves pure. The ones he returns to as a thief in the night are his servants who have turned aside back to the world and are getting drunk and are living just like the world. Those are the ones who Christ's turn will be like a thief night. The rest of them, it's like Titus 2 says, looking forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, I, I gave you my perspective when I was the day I was married. My wife's perspective was the same. As she walked down the aisle, she couldn't wait to walk down the aisle. We were only engaged for a couple months. We love the journey. We couldn't wait to be married and to be together and to cohabitate and consummate the marriage and be one flesh and be, have a family together. And that's the way every the, every bride of Christ should be. Looking forward to being with Him, to cohabitating with Him, to having that wedding feast, to being with Him for all eternity in a union that can never be broken. But as long as you're only betrothed, friends, this union can be broken. So beware, friends. Watch, pray, resist temptation, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You know, this, this dream for me, friends, I hope it'll do the same for you. It, it girds me more. It strengthens me more in my resolve to never sin again, to obey God the rest of the days of my life, to never break his heart, to never go back to any of my sin, the wallowing and the mire and the muck and going back to licking my vomit and never saying to him ever again, Christ, I just want my sin one more time. Oh, God forbid, friends. God forbid. If you're one of those foolish virgin, if you're one of those adulterous fiancés, one of those adulterous betrothed brides, repent, friends. There's still time. There's still hope. Get serious about your faith. Don't be one of those ones that when lawlessness continues to abound and abound, that your love grows cold, or maybe your love already is going to grow cold. Bring it back to white hot. Just like Christ told the church of Ephesus. You have left your first love. Return to it, friends. Return to it. God bless you.